islamista Pusto sa Bienala ponovljali za njim Aline Lara Rezende. Ne izkoristim to priložnost, da vas povabim še ena naslednja dva bio pogovora 17. januarja na temo podatkov, zoper tu, v tem poslednju odhodu Hajdovčina in potem še zadnji 7. februarja v Muzeju za arhitekturo in oblikovanje na temo modrost. Obe nam je danes priložno, da predstavimo še drugo številko common knowledge, o kateri vam bosta več povedala tudi Kustosa. Posebej se za ta dogodek želim zahvaliti podporju in izuzemljega velikoslaništva in posebej lepo pozdravljam danes v Slovenskega poznanika gospoda Marka Hensa. And uh, the stage is yours. Yes. Can you guys see me? And the voice is okay? It's okay. So, welcome to our second uh, talk uh, during uh, Bio 26 Common Knowledge. Uh, my name is Aline. Uh, I am uh, together with Thomas, guys, we really curated the biennial. Um, I will just give a little introduction of the talk today before inviting our guests. We have four guests today. And just to tell you the format of our discussions, we're sitting down because we want this to be a bit more informal. Um, we're going to have a question and answer session just by the end of the second session. So if you have questions from the first uh, uh, panel, first round table, please. Uh, take note <laughs> and remember because I don't want to interrupt uh, the whole conversation so we'll have more information in uh, the second session and then we discuss with all the panelists together at the end. Um, yes, so um, the talk today we want to talk about information. Uh, you see like the, the, the topic of this whole biennial is information crisis. And then if you have the chance to see the central exhibition at Mao, you understand that we are dividing this um, exhibition there in five different parts, starting with the information crisis. Can I have uh, one catalog, Thomas? So then I, I'll show you the, if you guys have seen that, like we have this. Hello, hi, welcome. <coughs> So we have this uh, uh, pyramid diagram that we are actually using to um, help us organize our thoughts and also help us curate projects for the exhibition and uh, of course help us understand uh, the crisis. Like in order to uh, solve any problem that we have in life, first we have to understand what it is uh, and where it is that's going on. So this pyramid, um, called knowledge hierarchy or from data to wisdom and actually this comes from an information science uh, sciences background this army diagram was created in 1989 um, and actually this is something that Thomas and I we felt the need to find definitions and to find a system to actually talk about this whole um, world that is information so it's quite difficult to grasp and we had to find a way to pin it down and actually create a cohesive storytelling, a cohesive uh, exhibition that we actually make sense of it. So in this, we defined, like we found definitions of what's data, what's information, what's knowledge, and what's wisdom. Um, this pyramid that you see here, you see the basis is data and ends up like in, in wisdom, hopefully, uh, and is a relational pyramid, which means uh, data is just a bunch of signals that we have around and then um, can be anything, even like a collection or like a bunch, not a collection, but a bunch of objects that's not related or you cannot make sense of it, uh, facts, numbers, even when you hear big data, and that this is a term that has been around for some time, this is just uh, uh, signals, like we do not process, do not understand that. If we contextualize it and make sense of it, then it becomes information. And then in information, uh, uh, there's a definition that I'm going to read for you, the, the, the definition from this uh, <coughs> paper where the, this diagram was created. Uh, but this is basically context, uh, contextualized data. And then you go and then you have information, understand it, then it becomes knowledge, 
knowledge is more the how-to. I think that's why education is in knowledge. You learn how to do stuff. If you manage to learn this and how to, to do better, hopefully we get to wisdom. And in our exhibition, we're talking about wisdom in terms of um, decision making, uh, in terms of uh, democratic processes, in terms of uh, interdisciplinarity, how you can apply uh, to, like, uh, knowledge from one discipline to another, use the cross discipline um, tools, and so on. Uh, so it's just to, if you haven't been to the exhibition yet, so you have a little bit of a background of what we are talking about here. Uh, and now I just want to say a little bit, uh, I will read this uh, definition of, of information that is really precise, since this is from the information science. Um, and then um, Ru uh, Russo uh, Akov was the guy who created this, first came up with this pyramid diagram. Uh, he defines information as descriptions, as answers to questions that begin with words like who, what, when, and how. Uh, so this you can see it as journalist questions. Um, then information systems, uh, they generate, store, retrieve, and process data. Uh, so it means that in, uh, information is inferred from data. So it depends on data to become information, right? And then, said in other words, when data process, interpret, organize, structure, or present it to make them meaningful or useful, so they are called information. So for us, it was quite important to find out the differences and find the definitions of this, because in um, non-specialized uh, literature or in mainstream media, people use these terms inter interchangeably. Like what's data and what's information is quite uh, uh, mixed. Um, so another thing that we want to, to set your mind for today's talk is that we all recognize that we live in an overload of information. And when I say like a system uh, is overload, what does it actually mean? So what it actually means is that it cannot, it's beyond its process capacity. So it means that for us it is too much going on and we're just not able to, to navigate the sea of information and data and all of this that's uh, coming in this digital era. But this is not the first time that this happens. Usually this shift happens with any new uh, big technological introduction in our daily lives. Uh, we can talk even about the, like, the very first one that was the print press when we first had books uh, and uh, then, you know, the, the books, the knowledge that people got was not just handwritten and for some, uh, for, at the time that was like the, too much information going on and you're just printing ephemera and so after this, the printing press of course came journalism without the printing press was not, this would not be possible to have daily news like you, had, you need a year to have a book written down and so on uh, so the first one I have, of course, to say like Gutenberg. There's one great book called From Gutenberg to Google. So and talk through all these developments in technology, communication technologies, and uh, you know like the, the crisis that we, we live in. Um, and the second big one that I see is of course radio and broadcast because with radio and like electric or electronic uh, transmission of information came, you know, television, all the telis that you can telegraph, uh, telegraph, telephone, television, all of this comes with electricity and it's of course changed the society, how we behave, how we communicate, uh, professions, job changes. So this crisis that we are now in, it's not new. Uh, it, apparently we don't learn from the past, from our experiences, and now we like, we are trying to uh, understand how to uh, navigate all of that. Uh, for today's um, um, talk, uh, we divided, the, as I said before, like <coughs> sessions, like two sessions. The first uh, session we're going to discuss, of course, the like value of information uh, in two terms. One is talking about, uh, of course, financial value, like all this, you know digital products that we see going on, like Silicon Valley, all this industry comes from information, so there is of course money and financial value attached to it, not for the first time, that's always been the case as well. Um, 
And the second thing is about ethics in relation to this. So, of course, uh, who owns information, who is selling, who is profiting from our information. This is not just about uh, collecting data, this is making sense of our data to get money, like a third party is getting money. I, I would even risk to say that before, this is all, all that's quite common today was a job of espionage. And now we're very common, like, oh, it's okay, you know, it's our privacy goal. So we're not thinking so much about this. Uh, it's something that I would like to discuss, uh, uh, we would like to discuss in the first panel. Also, of course, the role of uh, journalism, the role of, you know, uh, credibility in media and all of that is in the first se uh, session. The, first, the second session then would be more related to uh, journalism and design. And of course, we are in the design biennial and so we have to go back to the topic. And we would like to talk about visualization of information, uh, how uh, design can help us filter, you know. There's actually a, a problem, say, that uh, it's not the problem of the amount of information available, it's also uh, actually a problem of filtering this information. So what happened, for example, with gatekeepers, you know, was before the editors and curators, and so on, and uh, also design with interfaces and with uh, um, organizing, visualizing uh, the information and data that we, we get, of course, serves as a good future as well. And this can be a very strategic, strategic, uh, strategic tool and very necessary uh, for us to, to pay attention to the importance of design nowadays as well. So with this, I think it's... Uh, Done with the introduction. Uh, Thomas, do you have anything to, to add? No, I think no. Uh, we also, it's not a monologue from yes. our side. I no. think we want to yes. get a conversation uh, with our uh, guests tonight and then also uh, hopefully with the audience. As uh, uh, Aline summarized, uh, of course, this is a big, uh, it's a big topic, um, information crisis, and uh, also through the process in preparing and elaborating about the design biannual, we try to bring in as many informants, uh, so also fact-checking or seeing you know, how does this make sense in a way. And uh, I think these talks are a very integral part of the biannual, also in combination with the exhibition that you just uh, um, uh, introduced to and also with the projects um, that we present either here in Idaho, China with the associated projects. And we also want to integrate all those actors um, that we have invited so far uh, in bio also to give them visibility and, uh, um, and a face. Mm -hmm. So uh, we start our first session with uh, the two uh, guests. Um, so I may ask Katrina Bulatovic. Uh, to the panel. She is an investigative journalist um, <laughs> uh, and uh, also assistant editor of, hopefully I, I say it correctly, Raskrinkabanje yes. platform, uh, which is I think a special project of Austro. You're going to explain to us more in detail what Austro is about. Let's ensure that it's a non-profit uh, um, news platform that is uh, very much dealing with fact-checking, but your background is also in, let's say, classical uh, journalism, so you pretty much work with all Slovenian medias, more or less, that I know, it's daily newspaper, uh, daily newspaper, it's uh, RTV, the national radio and TV station, and other um, broad, uh, uh, news uh, media houses here in Slovenia. And uh, the second guest is Alex uh, Pustrov, uh, who is, whose background is a PhD in open innovation. He's also one of our bio um, advisors, he's from our advisory committee. Uh, he's co-founder of ABC uh, Venture Accelerator. And um, I mean, for us, it was also very important within the whole development of bio uh, since it derived from an industrial design um, um, uh, biannual, how the industries also changed. So, you know, economy is uh, within the context of design an important factor. Um, and this is why uh, Alej for us was also an interesting and important partner in developing these projects uh, and also exchanging. 
Um, yeah, so uh, I think we get deeper into your background when we uh, get in conversation. Um, you want to, uh, yeah. I think we have, yeah, start with the... Yeah, so um, my first question actually is a provocative one and it's to Alish. Uh, Alish contributed an article to our magazine on information, um, which was very... Um, Provocative one, I would say, yes, uh, to say that the, the problem of clutter and confusion that we get in information today is not the property of information at all. This is a problem of design. Um, and uh, I would actually start with this question just as a basic, why do you say this, that it is, it's not a quality of information, this is a problem of design. And then uh, the second question I will uh, still with you, then uh, you said a lot in your article about um, how uh, we can get more uh, value from information. And you work with, you know, um, um, startup scene and open innovation. And in this, uh, you know, we are the information, information era, knowledge society. This is what we sell with information and our knowledge. So I would also like you to comment a little bit on this. On, uh, what you mean by this, like uh, this approach of getting more value out of information? Yeah, so thanks. Um, I think <coughs> I'd like to start first with, with some information about information. Um, since the beginning of this year, so in 2019, um, we as you know, humanity have created more information than we have created in the whole history before 2019. And next year, it's going to be the same again. The amount of information that we are generating is growing ex exponentially. It's, it's <laughs> zeta bytes or whatever the huge number there is. And this exponential growth is essential to, the, to, to where we are now, to where we are living right now, and it's not slowing down. What we don't understand is that the, the future the amount of information is going to grow exponentially still. They say that, that uh, autonomous cars, as whenever they come, they will be generating a gigabyte of information every second, each one of them. Today we have one billion cars on the road. Imagine that all of them are generating information with this speed. And of course, this is uncomprehensible. We can't really put that into a context. There is no way how we can use them. So, that's why this um, is difficult for us to really make sense of. Okay? But at the same time, it's, it's an opportunity. Because there is a lot of talk in, in business, and I do come from business, I apologize for it, um, that information is the new oil. You know? And what do they mean by that? The original oil was important because it was an extremely cheap source of energy. So you could develop machinery, you could develop machine tools, you could develop a lot of things that you had to do, you know, with your bare hands. You could improve them and do it in a more productive way and you could simply get more value out of that simply by using oil to have machines. And now the same thing is happening with, with information. Um, you, by utilizing these huge amounts of data that we are drowning in, you can make much better decisions. And you can make much better decisions if you are an individual. Imagine what you do today if you have a disease. What is the first thing that you do if, I don't know, your knee is painful? You go on Google. You could not do that 20 years ago. You had to go to the doctor, and the doctor would have to prescribe you something. And in the meantime, if this was something serious, it could be too late for you. Uh, information can result in more accurate, better decision making, and in this way it can save lives, it can create value for companies that can sell you better products, provide you with better services, provide you with better news if this is what you are looking for. And I think it is important to understand that this is just the beginning. It's going to be much, much we are just scratching the surface of what is going to come in 10 or 20 years' time. I think it's very safe to say that the way how we are going to deal with information in 2030 or 2040 is going to be very much different than to what we do today. The companies that we will be using 
will be different companies that we are using today, probably companies that don't exist yet. Um, one of the most important, if not the most important, the most valuable company in the world is Google. 20 years ago, essentially, it did not exist. So who can tell me which company is going to be the most important company in the next 20 years? With the same trend if, 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 of exponentially growing information. Um, did that answer your question? Yeah. Well, well, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Go on. Uh, well, I think yeah, that sounds quite uh, provocative uh, in a way to, to you. And I think we are, I mean, we hear so much about I mean, this gold rush of information sounds more like a fast economy. And uh, if we, what we learned yesterday from the presentation of Ostro is, uh, you know, the time actually takes to deliver proper information and deeply um, researched or investigated uh, information. And I just have this quote from your uh, profile uh, from Ostro that says, uh, without in-depth reporting, journalism are merely messengers of the elites. While this suits those who rule, the public is deprived of the nearest approximation of the truth. Yes. So, uh, <laughs> I think you have uh, quite a different, uh, maybe not, but uh, anyway, so, um, uh, I mean, what do you think about this, you know, information is the new oil? Let me just uh, correct you at the beginning. I'm not an investigative journalist yet. I'm still quite young for that um, very important uh, title. Uh, there's a few investigative journalists in Slovenia and uh, in the world, and they're doing a uh, very important uh, and very big job. So I'm quite uh, and at the beginning. A so scholar. Yes, <laughs> we are all scholars uh, uh, the whole time, actually, a journalist. Um, but yes, thank you for that quote. Um, yes, I don't see information as business and I don't see media as a business. I see uh, journalism as a public service. I know that's quite naive, but uh, without good journalism and without credible sources, um, there is no democracy and there is no um, growth and uh, good living for all of us and the next uh, generations. So um, I think that um, we need to see information and uh, uh, journalism and media as something which is doing something good for public, not for interests of elites and so uh, politicians, um, uh, companies, and etc. So yes. Could you maybe a bit explore why you shifted from this public uh, news uh, or media houses to and start your? It's also a startup. Yes. <laughs> in a way, so it's uh, quite near to what uh, Alice's business is in a way. So uh, could you maybe explain? You know what was your motivation to do so and what is your strategy and, and I even think that there must be kind of a you know like a model of you know how do you you know uh, doing good for the public yeah. is, a, is of course a high uh, value uh, but how do you make this happen uh, also well, financially yes let me just allow one sentence why or what we are doing at Ostra because probably you don't know it um, it's Center of Investigative Journalism, uh, Ostro, is um, a new media which is non-profit and it was founded uh, one and a half years ago. Years ago. Um, and uh, the aim of, is, uh, of it is um, uh, writing and publishing uh, in-depth stories uh, about uh, relevant uh, topics, which takes time and uh, more uh, more fact-checking and more uh, sources which are more reliable uh, in comparison with mainstream media. And uh, in May this year we started with Rastinka Avonibak SE. This is a fact-checking uh, um, site where we actually um, browse into uh, different media and also different statements of politicians and other 
and we are searching for fake news, uh, their misinformation, uh, click bites, uh, which means that they're looking for our attention, uh, but um, in real they're cheap because they're not uh, giving us any relevant information. Uh, and we uh, expose that through um, analysts. So, yeah. uh, we decided to do that because um, we were disappointed <laughs> with the media system in Slovenia because uh, we weren't, it's seven of us at the moment, um, we uh, was so, uh, we wasn't happy with our work there and with work uh, of media because uh, we said that they're not doing uh, their job because uh, they're not uh, so in-depth as should be, and uh, they're uh, very commonly, uh, they're not doing for the public, but for the interest of their owners or of um, some uh, companies. It is like that you mentioned... Uh, and we're still work in progress, I yeah. still have to do, and we're still trying to uh, <coughs> how to develop a new model. Mm -hmm. um, I just like that you mentioned the attention economy. Yes. You guys are familiar with this term, attention economy? So I can explain a little bit, attention economy. Um, this is what's called, uh, like, how, uh, how say, like the digital com uh, companies, like big ones, like from Facebook to Google to Twitter to Instagram to all, all of these apps that you're so familiar with, um, how they study our uh, use of the apps to actually um, uh, grab our attention even longer. Because this is what they sell. They sell uh, advertising on their platforms, and for this advertising to be there, they, of course, they have to, have to offer something, and what they offer is our attention. So, this is called the attention economy. Um, it's quite a um, <laughs> 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 uh, um, quite a big discussion on this uh, uh, concerning you know like uh, all of what we've been, we've been studying the past year with this information crisis. Um, but it's also one point that I like to mention about ethics in this, right? Because. The way uh, these apps are created right now, especially uh, concerning social media, is in a way that we get addicted to it. They know of it. They know that every scroll that you give and you're looking for the next like or you're looking for some snippet of information about your friend or something, uh, that gives, you know, uh, our dopamine and it, it's like going to a casino, you know, like if you go to a casino, the, what's the name, this is lot uh, game, you know, the one that you just put one coin, the cheapest game that you have in the casino, this is the, the, the game uh, that they make the most money. It's not the ones that you have to bet a lot, it's the cheapest one. And this is what they're doing with our attention. So then this way you get so confused, you cannot have like a, you know, when we talk about this overload in our system, that we don't have capacity to process all that's getting to us is because of this. And this is manipulated, this is designed, people know about it. And so the, nowadays, lots of, um, uh, we learn today, like design um, ethicist. Like it's a, it's a person studying ethics of this kind of design. Because who, who is regulating it, you know? Like this technology is so new that no one is actually regulating. Maybe in the future, like you said, like in, in 2030, 2040, the, 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 our, you know, relationship with information will be different and I, I'm guessing that this is going to be one of the differences you know this is going to be much more regulated than what it is now um, so uh, I would like actually to to ask you guys after this uh, short description what I did like how does this attention economy um, works in your platforms or in the companies that you run if this is something relevant to you if you get analytics or data from your users to actually Feedback to, to that, how does this work? Can it? Sure, but uh, I do want to comment a little bit on this. I think that journalism and, and media, are, maybe this discussion is too narrow. It's, this is one of the <coughs> industries. 
and I agree with you. I, I think that probably we need more regulation here, and just like we need more regulation in casinos. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what the right level of regulation is. In Italy, casinos are mostly forbidden. That's why we, we in Slovenia built casinos exactly on the border with Italy, so the total Italians come here. Um, and you know, it's 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 a, a discussion for the whole society what kind of regulation is correct. It seems to me that media industry should be more regulated now with the new technology. But it is not really a consequence of, of having information. I mean, I've actually read newspapers from 1915. Have you ever read a newspaper from 1915? It's very much different to what we know now. It's not objective. <laughs> there is a very clear censorship. And it's very interesting. I must say, I was quite addicted to that. Um, and what I'm just saying is that this media space or media industry um, is changing and should and does require a different level of regulation or a private public um, interference than it did in the past, for sure. But I think that the discussion about information is much broader than that because the, the sheer amount of information that we are getting is influencing all industries and in all areas of our life. Um, let me give an example of that. Um, when I'm now uh, looking for a flight to London, and of course I go on Google and write fly to London, for the next one month, Google will be offering me flight tickets to London, and I'm sure you have the same experience there. Which can be a little bit annoying, I think you would agree, until you get a very cheap ticket. Okay? And honestly, I've gotten much better deal than I was hoping for. You know? And at the end of the day, Google was actually, I was actually quite happy with the fact that they were offering me daily tickets to London that are getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. Um, so, <coughs> the, the amount of information, and don't get me wrong, of course it can be um, misused, and, and it's something that we need to re uh, delegate, um, regulate, but at the same time it can be used to create better services, to create better products. We're talking about industrial design before. Now, who, for these chairs, how do they make these chairs? Who makes the decision? What kind of color do they need to be? What kind of a shape do they need to be? What kind of characteristics? Why do they fold? Who makes this decision? Designer does based on information from the users, based on the information from other stakeholders, based on his intuition. And these numbers of information, today this chair actually would be designed with a lot more input and it would be tested throughout the design process and it would be different designed for different groups of people. It would be slightly <coughs> designed in a different way for people who have bad needs. It would be designed differently for people in other countries. In Asia it would be lower because their height is lower. And I think this is a way how you can show that information can create better products, better services if they are used and utilized. And again, trying to project this into the future, I think that and I do want to be positive here for sure, I think that there is a lot of potential to create much better services, much better products. And we are just in the beginning of that. And th that did not answer your question at all. No. <laughs> well, that's great. Right. Yes. Yes. <laughs> you want to reply to this from your yes. perspective? Uh, well, I think that as you also stated at the beginning, um, it's a complete chaos at the moment mm -hmm. of information. Uh, seriously. There's an hundreds and hundreds of sources uh, with uh, online media, and if and from everybody you are like uh, attacked with uh, uh, with information, and they're trying to get your attention. Uh, but the problem is that a lot of information are cheap. It's like fast food. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very good, and it's it tastes good, but you don't have anything from, from it because it's, it's irrelevant. Tomorrow will be unimportant, mm -hmm. you know? And that's what, why, why we said, okay, we need to slow down. <laughs> Tomorrow, it's not the end of the world. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you get the feeling when you watch the news, you know? It's not the end of the world. We have serious problems at, at the moment in Slovenia and in society. But it's not, it's not going to be ending the world. 
we need to uh, collect those topics that are important for all of us, such as health, education, um, etc., etc., and we need to explain them to the people uh, why are important and what they should know uh, about it uh, with data and with relevant um, uh, sources. And the one thing that I think is important, I think that we as people and society and um, the next generations, because this is something I speak also as a young person, because I have um, friends who uh, are not willing to pay for media. Mm -hmm. We need to be aware that if we need quality, if we want quality information, we need to be prepared to pay for them. I think that's important. Uh, and to um, support those media out and those journalists that um, we are capable to trust. Uh, and we also need to support them uh, with money. I'm not saying a lot, but just to, to give, uh, to be able to pay for a newspaper that you trust or uh, a public broadcaster or something. Can, can I give just a comment, please? Because I think it does. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, even in the media industry, I think, uh, I think I'm the uh, in house optimist here. Um, <laughs> why they all dressed in black? Or? <laughs> um, ten years ago, we were reading local newspapers, and, you know, looking at the local TV stations, and we are, the amount of information available to us was quite limited if you compare to what we do today. And, and again, I'm not disputing that we do need the, the, the balance of public private um, support in the media space is changing, but. What media do you follow? Because I'm reading newspapers from the US every morning. I'm reading, uh, I'm looking television from the UK. I'm regularly uh, reading newspapers from Croatia and I'm all doing that in five minutes every morning. And that was not possible 10 years ago or 20 years ago. I, I can really remember what you, if you wanted to read a newspaper from the US, it would have to be physically delivered to Trieste and then somehow it will be shipped into Slovenia and it would take maybe two weeks or something like that. And, and today we have access to everybody all the time. Do we need to pay for that? I think we will actually. I think it's very clear that the media is already getting more and more behind the paywall and I think that's, that's good, I think that's positive. But at the same time, just simply in the media space, the amount of information and, I'm sorry, quality information is again increasing rapidly. Um, so I don't want to be too pessimistic here. Um, I, I, you know, if I don't think that Slovenian media is going to be very quality. I'm just not going to read them and I'm just going to read the US media. Okay. I'm, I'm wondering what you think about this. I'm curious, why not? <laughs> why not what? Why you don't read Slovenian media? No, no, I do. You do? Yeah, okay. I do. I'm sorry. Okay. I read all of them and it takes me five minutes. Be yes. Okay. Five minutes, so you can just headlines. Yes. I read those headlines that I like. Yeah, <laughs> just like a 140 characters news. Yes. Yeah, but uh, when I, I mean, when you reference like the media <coughs> industry or business, also to the industrial, uh, or the industrial design, with the chairs and everything. I mean, we learned throughout the 20th century. Uh, this is also why this bio took a transformation from industrial design to a more explorative platform. It's also that we learned about, you know, what have we actually achieved through mass production in the 20th century, uh, which was basically grounded also on planned obsolescence. And this is a bit what, you know, it's fast media, it's just the news that is already outdated the next day. The reality is that... Um, I like the image, but how can we actually, you know, with all the knowledge that we have accumulated for the past hundred and more years, uh, that our society is based on oil, how could we actually take these learnings into a new business field? Okay, now I think, I, I, again, I'm talking here about my opinion is uh, why information is actually better than oil, because while oil is extremely cheap mm -hmm. and was the foundation of, of the wealth that was created with the, with the machines that 100 years ago were, were put into action, 
um, it's not free of charge. So today, energy is actually no longer based on oil because we have other sources of energy that are much cheaper. And information actually today is arguably too cheap. What you are arguing is that we need to pay some price for information if you want to get some quality of information. Yes. At the same price, at the same time, there is so much information out there which is free of charge, but we don't know if it is low quality, high quality, or fake. Um, so I think that, that um, the, the, the value, and if I understand your question correctly, how do we derive value from, from them? Um, I can use that analogy. If I read New York Times today, um, I expect New York Times to be able to understand that I come from Slovenia, which I'm sure they do already, translate it automatically into Slovene language, perfect Slovene language, every day for every single article, and provide me those, uh, the, the, provide me the service that they know that I want. And the only way how they can do that is if they know a lot about me. I think we should be able to choose if they can have access to my information or not. And right now we are not choosing that. And this is where I think regulation is needed. But at the same time, if I do have an option to get a high quality service or even high quality media exactly to my need, tailored to my needs, I don't think that's a bad thing. Um, so I'll be the pessimist here, yeah. or a little bit critical of this. Um, First, uh, I'd to, to use a quote from Richard Sennett, he's a uh, sociologist from the UK, and he said, there's nothing is for free, absolutely nothing. There's no free of charge. We're paying with our data, we're paying with our information, we're paying with our privacy, we're paying by um, manipulation of algorithms, like all of this that you actually just described, that's something that you like. Uh, there's something that's done in the way it is, like in a massive amount, you know, like it, everybody in the world is being analyzed and fed to whatever we want, or we think we want, or the algorithm think we want. It means we're creating bubbles all, all over, and we know that bubbles are a huge part of the crisis. Like, especially if you think about the political polarization, like you just, like if you're more liberal, inclined, like you have this inclination since you read the New York Times, this is what I assume you are. They also assume you are, and the algorithm also assume you are, you know? So it means that you're gonna get all the news that, that is actually um, feeding to what you believe already, and not giving you the other perspective. And we need the other perspective. And this is the problem that's happening, that, you know, this divide in politics, for example, is happening all over the world, and there is a, a point for that. Um, I'm not, a, like, a, I don't study information science or, 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 you know, data science or nothing like that. My basis of all this whole study is one year, like, since I'm doing this by now. Um, but um, I risk to say that the, the, there is a huge the responsibility of technology and how they are using it. Like the, they, I mean, the, like digital monopolies, you know, they control the algorithms and then therefore, I mean, that's how you get the information exactly the way you want and I want and they want. And so we live in our bubbles. And this is, of course, manipulated by social media and so on and so forth. So, I mean, I'm just giving the, 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 the other perspective and the, so, of course, we benefit from it as well. And we benefit to the fact that we believe it's free because we're not paying from our pockets, right? We're not paying it. But it doesn't mean that it's free. And this I mean, is something we need to understand. I'm connected to this because I think it, it's very relevant to what you're saying. I think that actually most people understand that Googles and Facebooks are not free, that we pay for that with, with our information. And they still are happy with that. And there was, there was this uh, study done asking people um, how much do they value the services that Googles and Facebooks are providing to them. And I think that, for example, uh, and the way how they were measuring was they were asking people how much money would they be willing to pay for this service so that it would not be cut off. So um, I actually tested this with my students for Facebook. Most students are willing to pay around 20 euros. And for if, the, uh, if Facebook would not be free of charge and it would not be using your data so that you have to pay for this 
Most students would pay 20 euros, and students mm -hmm. are not the most affluent group of people. So for I would imagine 20 euros a month. Uh, I think a month, yeah. Um, for a study in the US says that for Google, <laughs> people would be willing, exactly. Yeah. I was surprised myself, I would never pay. Um, for uh, Google, people would be willing to pay 1,000 euros, or 1,000 dollars, I think, per year. And this is the value of the service that these companies are providing to us. But because we are not paying for this with cash, we are still paying for this with our money. I think that the, the problematic thing here is that we don't have a choice. Yeah. I think we would need to have a choice not to pay with, with our information, not to pay with them tracking us. And I, I think a lot of people, maybe majority of people, would not, would be still, would allow these companies to track them. Um, but we should have a chance. The last question? But don't you think you are also using a choice to select between uh, different providers? And uh, you know, when <coughs> it uh, happens, uh, the transformation of the media is very expensive. Part, so you could read your times in Slovenia. Probably not the most powerful media houses could afford that. No, every single one will afford that in a few years' time when automatic translation technology is, is completed, and yeah. trust me, it's no more than a few years away, you will be able to automatically translate every single language. This is, this is not far away from us. Uh, but uh, I'm not sure if I understand your question. But, uh, my question is, um, how many of my thesis is that uh, the, power, the media power gets concentrated in uh, fewer media houses than it used to be. And we are using the choice to, to diversity to select where are we going to get information from. And that's a fact that, that affects the quality of information we are going to get. We are easier, easier to be manipulated than before. So this is actually one of the uh, scenarios because uh, our last question to the <coughs> To, um, to paint um, a scenario of future um, journalism or media business or let's say industry or whatever <laughs> um, outlets. Uh, I, I would be curious, you know, if you had mentioned, you know, 2030, 2040. Uh, I mean, there is a reason, and also through our research, we actually learned how difficult it is for the, so, as you mentioned, in the mainstream media, like the newspapers, they, you know, um, are in heavy financial problems, uh, uh, radio, radio and TV station as well. So one thing is that it's accumulated by other bigger media houses. So I would be curious to learn, uh, to, to, or we are curious to learn, you know, what are your future scenarios? What do you think, you know, how, or what would be your positive or utopian or dystopian concept for this, the two of you? <laughs> um, well, um, I think it can get worse, absolutely. Um, I'm also teaching uh, in schools uh, uh, young people about media uh, and about media literacy. And um, it's quite frustrating when I ask them which media do you uh, use, what's media for you. And a um, 14 years old uh, girl uh, tell me that media for her is Instagram and Snapchat. I'm quite worried. But on the other hand, uh, I think that uh, I believe in good stories. And I believe that a good, well-researched and well-written stories with uh, relevant data, with relevant um, visualization um, will survive. So um, I'm optimistic in that. But you we have to, to you yes. <laughs> but in order to achieve that and to keep uh, core journalism alive, um, we need audience who are willing to um, trust us and support us and I think that it's also on us on journalists that we uh, do our job, that we are transparent and that we uh, do our job as best as we can because we also have plenty of mistakes. And 
Yeah, I think I think that media industry is probably going to be more a public service than a private one. I think both will coexist. Um, but again, I don't I don't want to make this discussion only about the media industry. Sure, I mean we need to have more quality information for sure, but simply and unavoidably we're going to just have so much more information. I mean, do you imagine about what we were discussing before? If you have automatic translation, you're going to get every single news, every single newspaper, every single media in the world in Slovenian language available to you all the time. You know, and um, I think that this is not going to be instantly. I think this is not the, the um, it's going to bring many additional changes, and these changes will be for the good and for the worse. But what I see as a general trend here is that this mass information will allow for much more individualized um, services. And I imagine that the, the media of the future, for me, will be a combination of, uh, you know, New York Times, uh, BBC, uh, Croatian, uh, something, and the Slovenian. Television and of course your portal, or merchant single Slovenian thing delivered to me exactly when I need it, probably when I don't know what I need. Uh, so yeah, being the, the optimist here, I think that uh, the, the, the information are creating value. I think that the sheer growth in the information is creating a huge amount of value, um, and it is on us as a society to minimize the, the, you know, the uh, disadvantages of this and to maximize the advantages. And we really need to, to include the public discussion about it, but we should be careful not to just say uh, change is bad, let's not have any change. Mm -hmm. And I think that's not possible. Try to talk with editors of mainstream media about that. <laughs> Well, thank you. Um, uh, yeah, I think that's an applause for our guests. Yeah, I think it's also a great introduction to our next session. I think, uh, I mean, we, we heard so much about, I mean, Alish is very much in favor of all that, uh, you know, uh, services, most of them sort of based on technology, AI, that, uh, uh, bring us uh, this fast information translations. I assume those are not physical translators. Those will be uh, bots uh, who actually do this. Mm -hmm. So um, I'd like to introduce Angelique Spannings uh, to come to us, uh, and she has the stage for the next uh, I don't know uh, five to ten okay. minutes. Oh, but then I have to put my. Uh, yes, you can already start to prepare, and we will maybe have a little technical break in between because she needs to set up her uh, presentation on the laptop. But um, Angelique, uh, um, she is the director of MU Art Space in Eindhoven, uh, and she's uh, one of our partner institutions for Bio26. Uh, they had an amazing exhibition called The New Newsroom, Reporting Redesigned in 2018. Uh, also as part of the Dutch Design Week, uh, which is very much about focusing uh, about the power of digital technology and news, how new interactions uh, on personal levels. And uh, she will give us a short introduction to, this, uh, 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 to their explorations with the exhibition. Um, and then uh, we will uh, also, uh, in the session that follows her presentation, we will discuss uh, the relation of design, journalism, and media. So, um, yes, so we also will listen to this presentation and uh, come back to the stage. I made a lot, but we will discuss it later. Um, uh, as said, I'm director of MU uh, and curator for a long time already. But I have a double life because before that I was a journalist. And um, uh, I, I studied journalism and art and cultural sciences in Rotterdam. Um, and for me that was a very important combination. Because in journalism uh, academy 
I learned how to write, I learned how to ask the right questions, I learned everything about media, but I wasn't really, um, it wasn't in depth, it was uh, skills and methods. And for me it was important to connect it to art and cultural sciences, to get deeper to, the, to, to what was interesting to me, and I didn't study uh, art history so much, because uh, I'm, a, I'm a born generalist. I really want to know everything. I want to know a lot uh, uh, about all different the kinds of different fields from all kinds of practices to combine that. Because I think that is what we need. Maybe in this age of specialization, we need generalists who can make combinations and dare to ask questions in a different field um, to, uh, to make connections. And, um, I switched from journalism, I was 10 years active at a newspaper writing uh, mainly about art but also as the chief editor um, uh, there because if you write good about art you become a chief editor in the Netherlands, I don't know why that is but I've seen a lot of that um, uh, and then I did a couple of years I did that and then I jumped across the fence and I started curating exhibitions and running an institute and for me, that institute is a 3D magazine, in a way. It is a place where you can share uh, knowledge, you can share culture, you can question things to a much higher degree that you can now do in uh, journalism. In ma many newspapers have uh, um, regionalized so much that you cannot uh, ask uh, global questions or general questions anymore. So for me, it was very important to um, to, to make that step towards the arts and take my journalist uh, practice and, and knowledge to that field and question that. So for um, 12 years I made all kinds of exhibitions but never on journalism. And then suddenly I felt like a, it, it, it all came together and my two lives became one again. Um, and we started thinking and working on the new newsroom because I had the feeling that there was a lot of energy amongst young artists and um, designers especially in questioning reality, in uh, thinking about information, in thinking about new strategies to deal with that. So that's where we started to make uh, an exhibition about it for Dutch Design Week, which is usually uh, a huge public um, uh, event. Um, especially because it's such a public event, I felt it was even more important to do it because I think that in all media technology, audiences and the education of audiences uh, often gets forgotten. Um, so that's why we made this exhibition. This was a very long introduction to what I really want to show you. Um, the next picture, please. This is what MU is. We're not a museum. We only do exhibitions. We don't have a collection. The next one. This is our video. I don't know if the sound is working. This was my, uh, my co-curator. Uh, she worked in our office. Very softly. What is news? What does news do to us? That's what she's saying. Maybe just uh, go on to the next one. This gives an impression of the exhibition, but I have a lot of slides um, that also show the works that we are having. What we did was we invited over 20 uh, designers and artists to make uh, mainly new work or work that they have never shown in public that way. Rogier Klomp is um, uh, teaching at the Design Academy in Eindhoven and he's very good at translating his thoughts and experiments into mind maps. So we started the whole project also by making the mind maps. And the setup of the exhibition, our space is a thousand square meters. The middle section was empty because that was the newsroom where everybody could get in and where every day there would be workshops, lectures, panels, everything happening. And the exhibition was around it, situated around it. Next one, please. Uh, we gave permission to do an emoji news feed because emoji, I mean, everybody thinks of it as funny things, but it's the newest language and it's the first uh, international language that everybody uses. But it's controlled heavily by Unicode uh, because they say which emoji gets in and which stays out. And Linnea Stalk is a Dutch uh, designer 
who uh, studies emoji, who's written a book about it, but she also does a lot of interesting experiments and trials to get new emoji found. So she invites people to think of the emoji they're missing. She studies um, uh, all media and use of emoji to see how, it, how they could get in. And uh, hopefully they will, uh, at some point, break open this Unicode monopoly on emoji. And then we really get uh, a new language. Uh, the next one, please. Maxime Benvenuto, I believe he's also, he has also done something in your yes. exhibition. Um, uh, he's, he's a good researcher, he's an analytical mind, and uh, for us he um, uh, took uh, 12 different uh, lexicons, so um, uh, the, the, the words and the meaning of words in uh, 12 different languages, and he took propaganda and news, and the descriptions and the, the meanings of it, and put them together. It turns out that propaganda in Russia or China or here means something completely different in a, in a lexicon than it, and then it does in America. So these kinds of differences are very important because that's the starting point where meaning gets created and where um, uh, also um, uh, you learn not to understand each other. It starts with the meaning of the words. Next one. Uh, DROG is a collective of designers and um, uh, 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 political students who uh, um, made a game which is called Bad News. And this I, want, uh, I have to um, read. Um, it's a game uh, that entices players to fabricate and spread fake news themselves, so they better recognize the methods involved. Players learn to, to master six documented techniques commonly used in the production of misinformation. Polarization, invoking emotions, spreading conspiracy theories, trolling people online, deflecting blame, and impersonating fake accounts. The, the game draws on an inoculation metaphor where preemptively exposing, warning, and familiarizing people with the strategies used in the production of fake news helps conquer cognitive immunity when exposed to real misinformation. In short, it turns out that people's ability to spot and resist misinformation improves after they play this game. Irrespective of education, age, political ideology and cognitive style. They play it a lot in schools but also in elderly homes. To, to teach people what is this fake news. Everybody says what it is, but what is it really? And how does it get made? And how can you recognize it? And how can you subvert it? I mean, that is knowledge, but that's not information. That is knowledge, how to do that. It's a skill. The next one is in the exhibition, so you can go see it there. I'll be short. The next one is about zooming in and zooming out. Uh, Dan Rubber, he takes... Um, uh, uh, photographs, uh, Google Earth photographs of, of places in the world um, and he puts them in the touch screen and when you touch the screen you get closer to the aerial view that you have and by zooming in so directly the, the emotion uh, comes in or you, your human uh, attachment to what you see is, uh, gets close. Like this is a very beautiful landscape, very colorful but when you zoom in you see, you see it's the biggest mine in Australia uh, an iron mine, and all the colors are toxics uh, that come out of, of the earth. So it, it turns into something really completely different. Um, the next one. This, is, uh, this was also a favorite of mine. Um, uh, Coralie Vogelaar is a, a Dutch media artist who um, uh, her first part of this work is looking for a possible algorithm for the popular news image. So she made an algorithm that, that went through 850,000 photos of the biggest uh, news agencies, photogra uh, photography news agencies, and she, select, they, she had selected the, the pictures of 10 big events in the world, um, uh, the picture of the same event that was used the most by international media, and the picture that was used least, of the same moment or close to each other, 
and had that analyzed and put next to each other. And then she worked with a choreographer and a, and a few dancers, and they reenacted these moments. So the, 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 the moment that um, was used the most, that we all have probably have seen in newspapers, and the one that was not used. And then by reenacting these movements, it turned out that, that, that you could really see the drama in it. So you, you got an analyzing uh, idea of what in these pictures um, uh, happens and why we select them, uh, probably, as the best one or the least uh, uh, interesting. Um, but the, another thing that she hasn't, hadn't thought before, but the dancers gave back, is that when they reenacted the most uh, used photos, it was easy. They got into a position and they knew what to do, so their bodily knowledge of what was happening in that picture uh, was there. They, they felt it. And they had a lot of trouble with the photos that were least used because there were awkward positions in there, or they, they, they didn't stand well next to each other, or they felt out of, of the image. Uh, something happened uh, in that sense. So that was more exciting for them to get the right position uh, and more difficult. But in the end, you could say that we all have bodily knowledge of, of these, uh, how, we, how we look at images. So that was an interesting thing for me to discover. Next one. Uh, Submarine Channel and VPRO are two big um, uh, cultural uh, agencies. VPRO is a, is a broadcasting company that experiments a lot and Submarine is a digital development agency making lots of films. Um, and they work together on uh, the industry mapping the Dutch drug economy because we, ha we do a lot with drugs and we're good at it and what they did uh, uh, is go into that subculture or that culture in a way and um, show what, uh, what all the people involved were in an interactive way. So you would go into a 3D uh, setting and you would hear all the stories. I think I'm going to go fast now through a few of the others. Forensic architecture, probably you all know, so I don't have to say much about that. Uh, Reporter on the Grenzel was uh, the uncensored playlist, was a very smart idea, I think, of this German uh, collective. Um, there are a lot of uh, countries where censorship is really heavy, um, and the journalists there have a hard time getting their stories across. It turns out that playlists and um, music services do have a lot of opportunity. So they got uh, uh, journalists from uh, China, Vietnam, let's see, um, and uh, Ukraine, no, Uzbekistan, Thailand, and Egypt um, to uh, put their uh, journalistic work on music and make it into a song and convey it through this playlist. And they, that worked really, really well. So they got in and, and it got listened to a lot. Of course, by showing it, it was a bit awkward because probably now it doesn't work anymore. But that was a very smart way of using um, uh, another uh, possibility, another technology to get a journalistic uh, story into um, these countries that were normally very, very heavily censored. Next one. We are, of course, a very important new um, uh, technology to use. Uh, um, I have two, we had two examples of it. Dong Wan Kam is a Korean, South Korean uh, graduate from the Design Academy who um, um, uh, used VR. Uh, he, called it, he calls it after photography because he uses uh, uh, an iconic news image and renders it in 3D and then puts it on a headset for the audience and you can walk within that uh, picture uh, and he gives you a hacked uh, digital camera so you can take your own pictures inside of that um, uh, 3D uh, image of, uh, of the news. So it, it brings you really close and it gives you your own perspective. The next one is Jim Brady, he's on show here also with uh, mobile journalism 
you could get within VR and have different perspectives on uh, big demonstrations. Um, but he moves on with his uh, research. And this is the next one. Uh, with a couple of uh, uh, friends and, and, and designing uh, uh, others, uh, they have formed a company called Post Neon, and now they are trying to um, establish immersive journalism. It's again in VR and AR, they're connecting uh, all these realities, trying to bring, uh, to, to have this new technology um, uh, and, and exploring it in, a, in, a, in an open way, questioning it, seeing it for the good, because immersive journalism is something that is much talked about, but they want to see it as designers and they question it also. So not only the positive side of it and the use they can make of it, but also um, what you can do as an audience with it and where uh, power comes in. Um, the last one I want to show <coughs> is uh, 4D News. Yeah, this is also still, this is 4D News. It's also on show here. Uh, it's a new work. It wasn't in our exhibition, um, but I, uh, 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 after we ended the exhibition, we had so much uh, new ideas that we are working it uh, on with it as a research tract developing new works with uh, certain uh, designers and certain ideas, and this is one of them. Uh, 4D News, they go over time and they try to, uh, it's Martina and Jonas, um, uh, they think that news is poorly contextualized, um, and they've, um, they've made a timeline out of news stories, so you would get back in time uh, for instance, in Aleppo, I think, they have one image where you could go back in time and see how this city was, how beautiful it was, how rich it was, and how it is now, and how it could possibly uh, grow back again. But this brings like this context that we often lose within news, because it's so momentary and so um, fleeting. Um, and I think that's an important idea to have these dimensions and this context to news. That's the, uh, the really, really last one, is uh, that we also, every design week for five years, we've been doing uh, talk shows. Every evening we reflect <coughs> on design, and um, uh, the first years were, were a big hit, and we, we had a big crowd, and then the year after there were like 10 talk shows, and now there are 50. Um, so we thought, what can we do? shouldn't we redesign the talk show itself? So we now uh, uh, have a, no longer a, a Create Out Loud talk show, but a Recreate Out Loud talk show, in which we ask designers to um, analyze, to take apart, to uh, reconstruct uh, talk show formats in a new way that we can place in other situations. Um, and I must say, it's, uh, it's, we're packed again. Um, uh, and it's very interesting to see how, uh, um, uh, from a creative perspective, there is so much more than the uh, obligatory table with chairs, uh, or the, um, uh, the screen, or the bench, or the um, what type of table, that's also very important. So it's, it's very interesting to see how you could not have a, how you can have a talk show uh, without uh, any furniture, or how you could have a talk show with someone who is blind, because um, and then you use other senses, and how does that work? If we all blind ourselves, what would the talk show be then? Now, these kinds of questions we, uh, we uh, research in this format with the audience, um, because that's always what I think is most important with everything we do, is to get audience uh, activated, to question, to uh, think together and to not uh, go for the answers but go for the questions and see where that leads us. This is where I want to stop. I hope it was not too long. Uh, I also would like to ask um, Ayush, uh, Ayush Windisch. Uh, here he is. He hid it behind the mirror. Uh, uh, so, um, Ariash is an information designer and uh, also works now, I mean, you come from data visualization and now you're working 
very much also into the digital world with all kinds of cross-section of technology and designing apps uh, and all these things. So a, a nice quote I found about you was, uh, you'd rather talk about outcomes rather than pixels. Um, and uh, I think, uh, I mean, we got so much footage from this exhibition mm -hmm. and we even are more jealous that we could not see it <laughs> desire. Uh, but at least we managed to, to, to get a uh, few works um, uh, also to integrate. Because that, I think that for us it was also important with the central exhibition, not just creating new works, I totally understand your approach and sometimes being a museum person I also very much like to be a new person, not having a whole collection to work with, creating new works. But we had the challenge project, uh, the commission project that we have commissioned and we really would like to focus also on what is out there, uh, if, you know, even from historic work to contemporary and yours definitely was one of the most contemporary work that just came out. And I think it's also, you know, there's no obsolescence about, you know, these projects are as, you know, new to us here as they've been when you first uh, presented them. Um, yeah, so um, as Aline uh, introduced this second session, I mean, before we we try to you know talk about the value information business it was much more about the the ethics of it and now being in a design biennial we could like to discuss or see the possibilities you know mm -hmm. what's the role of design for creative people I mean you work with artists not particular designers as well so what you know <clears throat> uh, I mean you you gave. You know, I mean, also the exhibition gave examples, you know, how to address. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, um, and I think, um, so maybe we can, I mean, maybe now that you presented your work, uh, I think it would be uh, also nice to, Ayers, to maybe reflect on, you know, where you derive from mm -hmm. and what you're doing at the moment. Uh, and I think you work at this intersection of uh, information and uh, and design. Mm. Well, I happen to have a mixed background in computer science and design, and my father was an economist, so that falls into the picture as well. And it's why I never really fall into a specific like template of a, a kind of design, like being a graphic designer or something. I was always kind of shifting a bit, doing different work, and. Through a lot of work I was doing, like web pages early, uh, I eventually came into media, and then within media, somehow stumbled upon data visualization information design. Um, with the, you know, the, the specific mix of know how I had. Because if you want to work in this area, you need that kind of like background, a bit of technical background, a bit of analytical background, all of that, to actually be able to do that work. And oftentimes you're also not able to do it on your own. You need other people with those specific, with those specialities to actually do it. Uh, we were doing that at the newspaper, Neonic, where it's the work for three and a half years, and we had a weekly section there, a full page section, where we actually worked uh, worked as, uh, you know, we were hundred percent authors of that. So we, we didn't get a theme and, and a lot of information already prepared by the journalist, only to visualize it. We were actually being journalists there, which is quite specific. Uh, role for us. Uh, at the time it was quite unique, like even globally, uh, at least at that kind of size of a, of a newspaper. And now there are a few examples around the world uh, like that. And today I'm more, more like in, uh, in software development, so it's quite a different context. But the technical know-how and you know, just visualization and, and, and in general information architecture, information design know-how is useful there as well. Uh, but there are big differences. There are big differences in the kind of content you work with and how you're applying your knowledge and who it's being to you, communicated to for what purposes. And that business context is really, you know, makes things a big difference in how you work. Uh, in, in newspapers, uh, one of the things I did like a lot was that the work you were doing was in the public domain. And the big difference now is that there's a lot of software doing it, it's completely private, only a select 
few users, it's not easy to solve that solve. But unless, of course, you're working on a global platform with access to millions of users, which we are not, there's not an IMAP, uh, that's very private. You know, it stays there, it's, it's really hard to show the work you did. So one of the ideas of this session was actually to focus on this visualization of information. I think it, this is one of the most powerful, um, uh, I don't even know which one, word to use, tools or idea behind design, uh, what design can do for us in this whole mess, this crisis of information that we're in. Uh, one is of course serves as a, as a filter, as we talked in the beginning, but also this idea of visualize, uh, this, uh, make it visible, not just through infographics, which is a, a way of storytelling, but through uh, data visualization, which is like uh, all these charts and from simple bar charts to what you presented, like uh, from what we see now in our exhibition from the new newsroom. This is a way to show data, but in a much more um, understandable way for us. Uh, I love this work as well, the 4D News, where uh, especially when the designer was here and explaining it to us, what is actually this work is about, so is that the index uh, of words that she's mapping throughout years, you know, like uh, it, the Aleppo story starts from the 90s until now, and then how these words actually change in media and stories, how does it tell, so it's actually if you, if you think of an index, is a list of words. But the way it is presented through design, you actually, it's interactive, you understand exactly which year that story was talking about a little in the touristic way, come visit, la la, and now it's like this horrible place uh, that's, you know, just uh, problematic, and then, and so on and so forth. And the other example they present in the News is, is this example about the refugees coming to Germany, and um, the word they actually mapped out was this we, uh, in the, in the this news stories, when uh, Angela Merkel would say, we can welcome all the refugees, we can, do, we, we, this word we means something completely different in different contexts. So the designers are actually analyzing who is the we when the media says, we. is it we the country Germany, we Europe, we the whole planet, the, like who is we? And I think it's quite interesting because, like what you said, like the first thing is the play playfulness with words. It's a trick. Mm -hmm. So, do you have other examples to give in relation to, to these, like other words, maybe that uh, try to make us aware that uh, there's a word play going on? And well, there's many word plays going yeah. on, I think. Um, what, what you just said, like the, the, the first discussion was about ethics and now we're going to talk about design, but I think design is very much about ethics yeah. no, and about analyzing what it is <laughs> and like the, the data as oil. Um, uh, I think like if, you're, if our feet are still within the oil, then our heads are in the knowledge and um, in the wisdom, maybe even, and I think that democracy and all these values that we have are in in that realm. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe the data is connected to money and to economics in that sense. But um, if you want to talk about other systems of thinking, but also changing uh, the way we use that, like I, I, if I hear this discussion, I always I think like that's why artificial intelligence is so important because. With our own human intelligence, we can no longer mm -hmm. understand this 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 data um, uh, abundance. Um, so we need other intelligence, and by by thinking about artificial intelligence, we start thinking about possible other intelligences also. So it opens up our our um, thinking again, at least in in a cultural way and with designers. Um, and suddenly, it's not like uh, there's a lot of AI thinking going on, but otherwise, but I think there's also this widening of the idea of intelligence in other ways. So, for me, because because we are putting an A before the I, mm -hmm. we start thinking about the, that it can also be an O, like other intelligence, mm -hmm. and that's also wordplay. So in, in the beginning, we only think of intelligence as what is in our own minds, and now we start opening up to many. 
that that's also something uh, I think that is so much connected to what information is, what knowledge is, what journalism is, what, how we look at, how we learn. That it's uh, that everything is shaking in that in that whole area. So that's why I'm very curious what you have brought together also, yeah. because there's so much to think about, to learn, to see, to discuss, to to get acquainted with that um, um, it, it will not, I think our lives will not be long enough to get a grip on it. Mm -hmm. uh, although I also like data visualizations a lot because sometimes they suddenly make you see something that you've never seen that way before or understand something in a different way. So it's not only words, it can also be images that really do the, do the trick. Yeah. In the newspaper, for example, we were applying them at very different levels. So you may have a short news story with you know, just a, a small amount of data that, you know, if it's visualized, it's easier to comprehend for people. Mm -hmm. Then you have something that we had on a weekly basis where you can cover a more bigger topic. Sometimes we would even push this further where we would cover a topic that may have been going on for years and people have simply lost track of what was happening, like some of the uh, research stories that the newspaper. The newspaper journalists were covering. Yeah, you just lost track of like cor corruption stories, for example, who did what to do. Mm -hmm. Suddenly you visualize it and people went, oh that's that. Mm -hmm. right. And one of the things we were playing with was the idea of, okay, so you have news and what we like to call the early draft of history, right? Then there's nothing, and then you have history books on Mexicans and so on. Right? What's in between? Well Wikipedia I guess is the best in between right now, right? Mm -hmm. And the way it's being produced, but you know, why isn't something like that coming from the newspaper. Why is the archive of the newspaper a snapshot of written stories, which isn't really useful, right? But if that archive is you know, relationships between people or relationships between events, mm -hmm. uh, and you can go from shorter to longer formats and all of these things are interconnected and visualized, then it's much more useful. Maybe yeah. it's also easier to monetize, right? Actually, this is something that I always have in my mind. How come we're the you know information era and the first industry to collapse is journalism? I mean, they, it should be you know employing journalism is not an industry media. Right? Yeah, media. Yeah. Journalism is one of the activities in media. Yeah, right. Yeah, but I mean, if you think like any media organization, yeah. news organization, as whatever, play with the words how you want to call it, but uh, um, it's everywhere in the world breaking down, like they, they have no model, business model to go on and then like it's it's almost like a paradox, right? Like they should be hiring everybody here to actually... Um, Are they all breaking down? Well, I, I wonder no. if it's all breaking down. I mean, I think They're the not. old formats are breaking down and the ways of, yeah. of uh, channeling what we call news, uh, but our, our, our uh, understanding and our need for information is also growing and we learn a lot and we learn to like the tools are democratizing so fast that you may not need a newspaper anymore to to find your way and then mm -hmm. Google may be one of the ways to do it but I'd rather have more so the choice is very important to have but uh, then I would like to have uh, multiple choices of, of platforms to use. Mm -hmm. And I think like especially in, in uh, culture and design there are many. Like Yevgeny Morozov is one of the biggest um, uh, critics of the internet and of, of, of media technology. He started the syllabus now recently which is a, a way of, of bringing on, on 26 different topics um, the most important uh, uh, information that you can have. Like it's really like thin Mm -hmm. um, a way of channeling is a gatekeeper to the max, but for the people that really want to understand certain things and want to be uh, uh, informed on it, you know how to find it and how to get it, and he will bring it to you. Mm -hmm. So that that's also there's a lot of these new ways of, of thinking and, and collaborating, and I think uh, I heard just now like we are getting more it's getting more individualistic or like more. I think not. Mm -hmm. I think it's becoming more uh, collective. Open day. Um, open we, we want to share. I mean, that's that's a, a human uh, idea, or that it's a human need to share. I mean, my individual needs are not so interesting if I cannot share them 
with people. Um, uh, so as soon as Google only gives me what I want, I'm bored. Mm -hmm. So I want to be surprised, I want to share. And I don't think that, that um, the, the, the possibilities of, of what that means are, are, um, are used uh, at all, maybe like 5% of it by the big platforms. And now we're starting to get to do it ourselves. Mm -hmm. But do you think that, for instance, design or designers have uh, seen this opportunity? I mean, there's all these possibilities, this uh, gold rush, as we yeah. learned. It, is this the case? Well, I think at a at a low at a low level, not as an industry, yeah. they see it as an opportunity, and they, they the, the possibilities of using or hacking technology is is getting bigger. I I don't know how you see that. You're more of a technical guy. Maybe I'm too optimistic about it. But we have another optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I'm, love it. I'm very differently optimistic than than. Uh, I see what go what goes wrong, but I also see the ingenuity. Of of uh, of young people that are digital natives that really know how to work it mm -hmm. and how to go around it and take make it their own and share in a different way. Um, it's not for nothing that the younger generations not even think about Facebook anymore. Mm -hmm. And it's not that they only do TikTok or Snapchat or whatever. They also have their own ways of communicating and, and using uh, the technology that's around. Mm -hmm. So. I'm, I'm not all uh, old and uh, pessimistic. <laughs> <laughs> and when it comes to role of designers, I think the opportunities that you may have seen, I think there are two different things uh, to consider. One is one-to-many communication, one is many-to-many. -many. And you can, as a designer, you can work in both today, right? Now, one-to-many would be a very specialized investigative journalistic outlet, like Oshlo or Chirp and something like that. And we need them. Let's be clear over here, right? And as a designer, you can choose to say, okay, this is a clear trend happening here, right? Like really hardcore journalism is probably going to survive as a non-profit venture uh, in that kind of forms. Uh, because historically, it's been financed in ways that are not sustainable today, right? With the kind of models that they were unique 50 years ago, they're over there, right? And as a designer, I want to follow that trend. I want to help these people either through visualization or help them to develop you know, the channels that they are using to, to spread their information, the ways they're spreading in general, how they're structuring their stories, all of that. On the other hand, you, as a designer, you can say, well, there's this explosion of many to many communication through platforms. I want to go to those platforms and contribute to their development. Right? And I think it's down to each individual designer to choose which one they, they want. Right? Uh, you had impact in both. The, the maybe the difference between going to if you go to many, to many for example, on onto the platforms, you're going to be part of a huge design team in those platforms, and your individual contribution may be relatively small, and your voice may be relatively small. Right. So unless you're able to go like through the through the ranks to become a design director, you're just a senior designer from there. It's, the question is how much individual contribution and power you actually have there. If you get to a final level, then you do, of course. You're making choices on a huge scale, but there's also incredible responsibility that, that comes with that. Mm -hmm. And when you do have that responsibility, it's really important to also understand the business context, also understand the technical context, understand the historical context mm -hmm. of what's happening. Because otherwise, your decisions will be too narrow and too naive. But I understand this is a very um, deep knowledge of the field that you have, coming from you know computer engineering, also media journalism, and so on. But you have this literacy to choose which trend you want to work with, or you want to follow, or whatever, as a consumer, or as a reader, or as a professional. But uh, do you think uh, we have this uh, literacy now? Like we as a society. Do you understand? That's me. Yeah, that's me. Yes. You know, the, I do not subscribe to the idea of golden era in history when everything was. No, but this I disagree because you know, like, if, especially if we have, if you think of a newspaper or news media at the time of dictatorship, people yep. knew that news were being censored. 
so they knew that you know something would not be said to them. Mm -hmm. uh, so that even like a, the, our, one of our mentors who was working with us uh, for the, the newspaper challenge, for the brain -in. This is one uh, of his comments that he says, uh, Ali, Ali uh, Sergi, yes, sorry, uh, but Ali um, said this. Yes, of course. We, we, if you look at the newspapers from this, you know, from dictatorship, from this era, of course, you see lots of quote unquote fake news. So you see propaganda. You see uh, something that is manipulated and not transparent. <laughs> But at that time, people knew the difference. And they learned to read between the, the lines. lines. And they learned to read between the lines. And today, I think we are still so immature in this. Uh, I mean, we are, we have computers at home for since the 90s. Mm -hmm. So this will be 25 to 30 years that we have this technology at home. The internet even a bit later. Um, for us to have uh, to be mature enough to understand what's what's what. So how did they, they learn at the time to read between the lines? And that's the question. Uh -huh. Somehow they had to learn it. Mm -hmm. So somehow we have to learn it today. And you also used a really extreme example. You know, I was referring more to media in general in the last 50, 60 years with the kind of business model they had just collapsing today. Mm -hmm. you know? I don't think that 50 years ago readers were any more literate about what they're reading and today. And I work in media business, so I know the numbers behind it. And most people who voted Naomi did not buy it for hardcore news. They bought it for the crossword. Mm -hmm. You know, Pop TV uh, and other TV stations historically has, have created the news hour so that they would increase their legitimacy in Red Belt. What do they live on? You know, it's the TV shows, it's reality and all that, which is by the way financing the news of and research journalists. You know, unless you're BBC or New York Times, which has you know an ownership of a family, which is a billion, you know, billionaire family, which is willing to finance that. Um, you have to understand you know how, how that media really works and how people are consuming it. And this is why I do not subscribe to this golden age idea when everything was right and people were literate. Of course in dictatorships or even worse when it goes for their lives, they get much, much more intensive. Right? But in general, like in everyday life, in no normal quote normal situations, I think it's just the same today as it was, you know, before. Granted there is a lot more information today and it's easier to get to it. Right? But they somehow got literate back then, somehow they will need to get literate today again. And that's maybe where where like it's not you said many to many, but it's and mass media are like uh, too big. But if you see like comments media or like the, how you share not the, uh, the knowledge in your in the context of the people, that it's never this one thing that informs you. It's everything around it. It's how the people around you respond to it. How the, how the old teach the young, and the other way around. And that's I think very important. And with the big changes that are going on now. Of course, we feel a bit quirky and, mm -hmm. and 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 we don't really know anymore. But we want to, and we need to talk like this, and we need to read, and we need to think, and we need to di to, to dispute with each other about what is happening and how to to deal with it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the that's the I, I think that's a good thing to have that and to be able to do that. Um, so I'm, I'm not so interested in the big money-making machines and how they operate. I'm more interested in how people try to find new ways of, of dealing with that and learning to to um, to read it, read things or understand things. Not only read, but understand things for what they are and what they can bring and what they don't want of it. So and just to add to you, um, you know, we basically come to education and, and how you're being yeah. raised. Kids, and that's relevant. Right? So I have a six-year-old daughter, and I will teach her why she has to lock the doors. I will teach her why she has to look left and right going over the street. But I also taught her when she started looking at YouTube and immediately fell down the rabbit hole of the algorithm to all the really bad stuff that's out there. I took the app away, and we stepped down. At the time, she was four years old, and we had a you know adult conversation where I literally explained to her like why this type of people are doing this type of content, how it's affecting her through this channel, and she understood that. 
and eventually she just said, I don't want that. <laughs> Give me that one where I can open it and I'm not going to be scared of the cartoons inside. So, yeah, regulation on one side, mm -hmm. we need it, right? But also education and, you know, especially raising the kids in the right way. I think you know, the one thing that worries me in the Netherlands, you have, uh, like, all schools are digitized and, um, and it turns out that 90% of all the laptops that are used and all the iPads and the pads that are used are uh, funded by Google mm -hmm. and have only Google software on it. Yeah. So they are taught to only use that. Mm -hmm. And I really think that's a bad thing. Mm -hmm. So um, we, as, a, as an art institute, we, we set up a, 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 a line of, of education that we are rolling out and it's called the Creative Code. But um, uh, it's important to try as much as you can to, to learn and to, to share what you've learned and um, bring in as many people with separate skills to do that together. Mm -hmm. I mean, talking about just one thing, last question sort of before we ask the really last question. Talking about education, uh, I mean, do you think uh, is design education well prepared for this? I mean, there was a kind of a classical, you know, information design. If you enrolled for a design class, there was information design and what you did with poster prints and whatever. I mean, but things have evolved enormously. And I mean, since we have new courses uh, popping up, like, you know, the whole criticism, open, social, I mean, a lot of things, but this sounds so much more interesting. <laughs> uh, and I wonder why is there no, you know, or maybe we just dismiss them, because, I mean, these are just, you know, a few work people that, you know, seriously work in this field, or, but there is no school, you know, like, uh, at a, at a certain time, like I hope stood for a particular approach in design and materiality or immateriality, yeah. or something like this. I mean, did you, did you hear anything or? I see in, in Eindhoven, in the, in the Design Academy, for many years there was nothing going on in the digital field or nothing seriously interesting coming out of that. And the last four or five years, this is changing rapidly and there's interesting projects coming out and students doing really <coughs> a deep research and um, uh, I, th I think it is changing and I don't think it needs to be a separate academy to do this kind of thing. No, no. I think it should be embedded in all art schools and design academies and universities to, to, to get it together, not, not just like one new discipline with a, now in a nice box. Yeah, yeah, but this is what I really like also this comparison that Alice uh, brought. This, you know, like this kind of a, uh, uh, you know, information as a resource, so whether it's oil. I mean, you know, yeah, that it was the, the materiality or mm -hmm. immateriality mm -hmm. of information as a design um, uh, resource. A resource. Yeah. I mean, and we work with wood, metal, you know, these classic uh, materials. And it's so amazing what you actually can form. And it's, first of all, it's, I mean, it can be polluting if it's uh, applied wrongly. Yeah. But it's, in terms of the nature, it's not like, you know, it has another kind of sustainability. And uh, I think there is so much more that you could actually, you know, uh, uh, start to work with. So I just wonder, as I said, it does not mean new, new institutions, but yeah. I think existing institutions really should also look into this mm -hmm. resource and yeah. the yeah. possibilities. Well, I just want, wait, yeah, one, co one comment. <laughs> that, that was my, that was my uh, uh, vision or what I would wish for. Yeah. yeah, but this is actually the basis of our commission projects. Because our commission project here for the Bayeria, we uh, invited uh, designers to rethink the um, knowledge institutions, knowledge uh, institutions of knowledge production and transmission. Mm -hmm. And of course, this includes the, the, the museum and university, library, uh, newspaper, and two other ones that are not embedded in this uh, enlightened uh, way of thinking knowledge. We have uh, also the botanical garden and uh, retirement home. But this thing of rethinking education, like the, our challenge for the university group, for example, was 
um, towards new learning economics. And what they proposed as their project was completely a uh, breakdown of disciplines in the university and bringing people together. And this is actually in our exhibition, um, uh, the central exhibition, this is how we try to envision the wisdom section of the mm -hmm. exhibition where uh, you can use tools from different disciplines to create another project. So for, for instance, architecture, for example, is in this room mm -hmm. where you use tools of architecture you know, to present evidence uh, in a court case and mm -hmm. so on. Um, so, yeah, just to complete what you're talking about, so your mind is... <laughs> oh, um, but I want to make one point and bring back one point that you made that I have something that I also tr truly uh, believe uh, what will be the good legacy of the of our of this year information year or of the good legacy of algorithms already this is my personal opinion which is uh, to bring back uh, you know the, the like systemic thinking because you have to think in systems if you want to like you know more about this since you you also code um, so you have to to bring back the way we see like from us, like our time we, we still educate into disciplines. So you see like the specialists, I'm also not a specialist, Thomas not also, like we're not specialists here. Um, and I think we need more generalists as well. Mm -hmm. But having said that, uh, the point of artificial intelligence versus other intelligences. So I want you to, to talk a little bit more about this and what you mean about order intelligence. It's multiple brains together. There's artificial intelligence uh, that um, can uh, uh, be taught, but that can also uh, teach itself. So then it becomes another intelligence. But there's also um, natural intelligences that, are, um, that we are slowly revealing mm -hmm. how it works, like the, the, the wood wide web, for instance. Mm -hmm. You could call that an intelligence too, like how the trees communicate through chemicals and through the fungal systems underneath. Over, we are only getting to learn these types of knowledges. I think there's indigenous knowledges from people that we've always discarded that are very, very, very important to look to get to learn, and we cannot discard other intelligences anymore. So that it's it's the other intelligence and the complexity of the world that uh, maybe we're now zooming out too far. But uh, that that's what I think is important now, yeah, especially in an information crisis. Mm -hmm. Maybe to ask you and touch on the uh, question of education, uh, and I'm going to jump to industrial design for a moment. Right. So if you wanted to be an industrial designer, you had to learn about the materials, but you also had to learn about Economics and all of these other topics. I was thinking about the University of York, right? Mm -hmm. They simply join three schools into one campus, and while yes, you do go to one school officially, essentially from the first year onward, you're constantly working with your teammates and in integrated teams. And I think it's a much better model because A, no one will have all the knowledge in one person, it's impossible, right? And you learn teamwork and you learn you know, the business of as a designer the business side of what you're working on, the technical side of what you're working on, and you're really much better equipped to then work later professionally. You throw a bit of critical thinking in there as well. So, yeah, so much better. Yeah. Well, I think we, that was rich, and uh, thanks for yes. sharing all of this. Uh, the Amazing. first and the second panel, I think this is a great applause to be <laughs> In the meantime, not just we are chilled, also the drinks are chilled. So let's have a glass of wine together and continue the conversation face to face. So thank you very much uh, and thanks thank for um, coming and uh, yeah, staying with us. <laughs>